everyone. The clock on the wall says it's time to start, and out of courtesy to those who might be watching us on the internet, we want to be prompt. It's always easy when it's just us to make sure everybody's right, and we want to finish the punchline of our joke, and we want to greet the friends who are here, but uh, those at home are waiting patiently, and so let's go ahead and get started. Though, there's always a sort of a secret that a lot of priests do, and that's that you don't want to start so prompted that those who are still in the parking lot get penalized. So I'm going to do a little Christian education here while we're waiting for the last people to come in. And I brought something that you've never seen before. I mean, you haven't seen this one because it's my own personal property. This is those, I mean, I wear the white ones that you have. I wore your purple one during Lent. Do you know what this is called? Chasuble. Chasuble. That's right. C-H-A-S-U-B-L-E. It's from the Latin word, the same Latin word that makes Spanish for casa which means the house. And so a chasha, chasha would be a house, and a chasha bull is actually a little house, sort of a diminutive. It's my little house, and if you look at it, it's sort of like a tent, isn't it? It's a very tent-like thing. And this was what Roman citizen men wore back in the day, the time of Jesus and thereafter, in the earliest days of the church. Um, this was the underwear, the alba, the owl, but it just means white. And so this is what they would wear around the house. The stola, the stole, was a sign that they were ordained. It was a kind of, you have different stoles in different patterns as you wore them to indicate how you were ordained, whether you were a deacon or a priest or a bishop. And the simple way like that is just, it means I'm a priest. And then the kasula, the the chasuble would go over the top, and it was for when you were out in the street. And it was to keep your underwear clean, I suppose. <laughs> you want to think of it that way. And uh, now it looks even more like a tent, doesn't it? <laughs> I'm not sure if the people at home can see. I'll give them the full swirl. I mean, it's... But uh, if, if you were out hiking, you, you're in Rome and you're trying to walk over to uh, Ostia Antica, a boat where you're going to catch a boat somewhere, and it might take you a long walk. Well, if night comes and you're not there yet, you pull it up like this, and you squat down, and then it really is a tent. So, I mean, it's a very practical investment. Why do we wear it in church? I mean, a lot of places don't. You know, they don't wear them. Uh, Baptist on Durham, and they're, they're still a very fine church. But I think we wear them in church because we are trying, in a way, always to remember that what we're doing is an ancient thing. It wasn't just invented 
it doesn't reflect us in our contemporariness as much as it reflects the ongoing, never-ending, always flowing stream of faith and belief that's gone all the way from the day of Pentecost all to our days. And this is what the church wore in those early days. We don't ask you to wear them, but the fact that the priest wears them is a reminder and sort of a, a teaching point, a visual teaching point, along with the cross or the flowers or so many things we have that are visual teaching points. And so this is my own private one. It was made for me. It's been in a box for quite a while, which is why it's all wrinkled up. I hope you'll forgive that. But in the ancient days, they didn't have irons. So we're going to pretend like it's an ancient wrinkle. <laughs> We've got the service ready to go, and nobody has arrived from the parking lot. And you've learned now everything there is to know about religious vestments. And so I think it's time for us to get quiet, center ourselves in prayer, turn it over to you.
Please open your black prayer books to page 355. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. God, you have built your church upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Grant us so to be joined together in unity of spirit by their teaching, that we may be made a holy temple acceptable to you, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Horsemen. 
But when he could no longer see him, he grasped his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. He picked up the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. He took the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and struck the water, saying, Where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? When he had struck the water, the water was parted to the one side and to the other, and Elisha went over. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The psalm appointed for today is Psalm 77. We will read it responsibly by half the verse. I will cry aloud to God. I will cry aloud, and he will hear me. In the day of my trouble, I sought the Lord. My hands were stretched out by night, and they did not tire. I refused to be comforted. I will remember the works of the Lord. And for all time, your wonders all the time. I will meditate on all your acts. And ponder your mighty deeds. Your way, O God, is holy. Who is this so great as our God? You are the God who works wonders. And has declared your power among the peoples. By your strength, you have redeemed your people. The children of Jacob and Joseph. The water saw you, O God. The water saw you and trembled. The very depths were shaken. The clouds poured out water. The skies thundered. Your arrows flashed to and fro. The sound of your thunder was in the whirlwind. Your lightnings lit up the world. The earth trembled and shook. Your way was in the sea, and your paths in the bright waters. Yet yeah, your footsteps were not seen. You led your people like a flock. By the hand of Moses and Aaron. The second lesson is from Galatians. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. <coughs> For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence, but through love become slaves to one another. For the whole law is summed up in a single commandment. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. If, however, you bite and devour one another, Take care that you are not consumed by one another. Live by the Spirit, I say, and do not gratify the desires of the flesh. For what the flesh desires is opposed to the Spirit, and what the Spirit desires is opposed to the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to prevent you from doing what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not subject to the law. Now the works of the flesh are obvious. Fornication, impurity, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, anger, quarrels, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, <laughs> and things like these. I am warning you, as I warned you before, those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. By contrast, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against such things. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also be guided by the Spirit. The word of the Lord. Thank Thanks be to God. God.
Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. When the days drew near for Jesus to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. He sent messengers ahead of him on their way to on their way they entered a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. But they did not receive him, because his face was set toward Jerusalem. When the disciples, James and John, saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them. Then they went on to another village. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, Follow me. But he said, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead, but as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, No one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Spirit, please be seated. I believe someone is going to be very happy if I were to preach from this side for a change, because there I am looking right into the internet. Can you still hear me and see me over there? Not a problem. And you? No problem there? Choir doesn't pay any attention to me anyway. <laughs> Just turn my back to them. No, I, I never have doubted that choirs listen better because they're always looking for, it sounds like he's coming to an end and we better get ready to do our next thing. <laughs> now I want to talk to you today, like I did last Sunday, about this green season that we've entered into, the season of what I'm going to call the season of education. It's not about Jesus getting ready to be born. It's not about people getting ready to witness the crucifixion. So it's not about Advent or Lent. It's not about Jesus being raised from the dead like all of Easter. It's that time in our spiritual journey when we've already received Pentecost and the Holy Spirit, and now we're going on about the rest of our lives. And every Sunday during this long green season, the scripture's going to give us stories. Stories about Jesus, about his teachings, about his travels, about his miracles. All of these are supposed to pr be preparing us to proclaim the kingdom of God. You can't proclaim it if you don't know that it exists. You can't proclaim it if you don't know sort of like what's the purpose of it. You can't proclaim it if you don't know what's the opposite of it. No, knowing about all of these things prepares us for whatever situation life is going to throw at us. Because in every situation of life, we want to be witnesses, evangelists, missionaries, inviters so that all of the people we care about and love and work with and meet they, that they can also join us in this never ending parade of faith that starts in the ancient days and that leads us all the way to the gates of heaven so the stories we're going to hear during this time some of them are very very familiar and some of them aren't 
Today, I think we've been given a couple of stories which are on the aren't category. They're not that familiar. Now, if you've been coming to the Episcopal Church for 30 years, every three years you would have heard this gospel lesson, but it's not one that comes up a whole lot like in uh, vacation Bible school. Yeah. It's, it's got too much to it. It's too uh, layered. And it sort of presumes that the person reading it is already well educated in every one of those layers. It, it has um, hints of deeper stories. It's not just a simple narrative. They were hungry, he gave them some food, they were thankful. No, instead it's set his face on Jerusalem, got some Samaritans thrown in, raining down fire and lightning. No, mercy will rain. Go from village to village. I'm going off to die. Can I follow? No, God, to bury my father. Each one of these things is going to be a reference to something else that's happening elsewhere in the Bible. And we can go through all of those. I think that's an excellent Christian education program at some point. Maybe not necessarily appropriate for the sermon, but I can give the same example if you look back at that first lesson. It's even maybe more obvious. You got your sheets. Turn back to that first lesson from 2 Kings. This is just really, I want to say, pregnant with me. It's got lots of stuff up there. Now, it does get complicated in the English because Elijah and Elisha or Elisha or however it's said in various contexts, they're so similar that oftentimes with a public reading you, you're not always sure who's doing what. Thank you though to the reader for differentiating. Elijah is clearly one and Elisha is another. It's not always read that way and so sometimes it's even more complicated. But if you look there phrase by phrase through here, there's things you're supposed to know about. The story will make a lot more sense if you already know what Bethel is. Why are they going to Bethel? What do we know about Bethel? Well, that's the name of a lot of churches we know of. It's actually Baith El. And Baith is Hebrew for house, and El is God. So they're on their way to the house of God. It's a place. It was an alternate altar where sacrifices were made before those days when Jerusalem became the only place with the temple. So they're on their way to make a sacrifice. It's where God lives. And so you go through there, and then it has this 50 men are there, the 50 company of prophets. We're supposed to know what that's all about. We're supposed to know about taking off his mantle and rolling it up and smacking the water. We're supposed to know about, oh, the water separated some from the left and some from the right. They passed over on dry ground. Boy, now that... That's one we are a little bit more familiar with. Doesn't that sound an awful lot like the Red Sea Crossing? It's not the Red Sea Crossing, but it sure sounds like that. May I receive a double share of your spirit? This brings back memories for us because it sounds an awful lot like Pentecost. Oh, you've asked a hard thing, he says. Chariots of fire and horses, flaming horses. All of these are references to other things that have happened that we're supposed to know about. Symbols of tremendous and deep meaning. And then Elijah is taken up. He's ascended to heaven. Okay, there's, there's an illusion that we're familiar with. On the bank of the Jordan. What else happens on the bank of the Jordan River? John the Baptist take up the mantle and follow him. That certainly sounds familiar. There's a lot in here that the reader or the listener, if they're well educated in scriptures and tradition, they're going to say, oh yes, what a clear and wonderful layering of lots of allusions. They're symbols of things we already know about. They reminder. They're reminders. <coughs> For us. So you actually heard about 12 stories all in that one lesson. Now it's presented as a narrative, and I think that the, in, it's intended to be, we sort of think this was like an actual event, and these were historical people. 
But even if you got to a place where you said, well, I'm not sure about that, but nevertheless, the story itself is never devoid of deep meaning. The more you hear it, the more you think about it, the more you remember the relationship God has had with his people from story to story to story, from generation to generation, from one tribe to another, one culture to another, and it goes on like that. This is important, and this is precisely why the church, in her wisdom, I think, gives us this long season where we're going to be reminded of all of these stories. As we go through our daily life, we need to be constantly reminded of things. Now, it happens in the secular world, too. I mean, we're, we're reminded of things. I often love to talk about the symbolism and the power of a piece of aluminum about this big. It's flat, and it's cut into six sides, and then it's painted red. And it's got four white letters put on the front. And depending on what country you're in, it's going to be in Spanish or in English or in German or whatever. But somehow, whenever you see that red aluminum sign with the hexagonal side, you know exactly what to do. Apply the brakes. It's a stop sign. It has actually no power, but it represents something that is the authority of the government to regulate public safety. And therefore, we all know, oh, I've got to stop and look both directions before I proceed. It's a perfect example of something that in and of itself is nothing, but it reminds us of things which have control over us because we have acceded to the authority of that agency. We willingly do what that sign tells us to do, to stop. Our willingness, yes, yeah, sometimes, I, I heard that too, huh? it's Texas, so we don't always assume people are going to stop at the stop sign, but still, the sermon point is valid. You know, that we, we live in a world where there are things always reminding us what to do, and when to do it, and how to do it, and with whom to do it, and whom not to do it, and where should we go, and what should we do, and how, you know, all of these things. Our brains and our habits and our, our, our whole lifestyle is based on Voices from the past whispering in our ears. Whether it was your mother who constantly is reminding you of where to park and be sure to look up for the sign so you can find your car again later. Or, or whether it's the doctor who, when you're looking at the menu in the restaurant, says, no, I can't, that's too much cholesterol, that's too much salt. You know, there's, there are always voices, reminders. There's power <coughs> over us. And we willingly... <coughs> We willingly live because this gives meaning and it enhances our life in good ways, whether it's health or safety or, or whatever. As Christians, we sometimes call it the sacramental system, whether it's something like a chasuble where it has a meaning of the ancient days, and, or whether it's the bread and the wine which in and of itself seems to be absolutely nothing, but because a prayer has been said and a promise has been given by God, we receive it as something much more, and we look at the chalice, and we can automatically think of all that we know about that chalice, and about the Last Supper, and about Passover, and about the drinking of the wine, and the treading of the grapes, and the crushing of, get the juice out, and grind the wheat into flour, and, you know, that. There is no end of all the symbols and remembrances and the stories that go into any one of our sacraments. So that when we approach it in faith, our brains are spinning with all the things we learned about it, whether it was from Sunday school or Bible school or from our, you know, by sitting on our grandmother's knee as she read us out of the Bible. Or I learned an awful lot up at Texas A&M as a freshman when I went off to the Bible study. You know, I didn't have never really studied the Bible that much, but this, we opened it and we discussed it in a safe, comfortable situation. I mean, it was amazing how I thought, I already know a lot of this. How does that happen? Well, of course, being a Episcopalian, I knew about it because it's all there in the prayer book. 
<laughs> so almost everything in the prayer book is a biblical reference. And so I was reading the Bible, not realizing that I was getting it coming back to me from my experience in the prayers of the Episcopal Church. However we get these stories put into our brains, it's, that's really, it doesn't matter. It can be in a sermon, it can be in a class, it can be in a Bible study, it can be on the knee of someone we love. It can be in self-study, it can be on YouTube. You know, there's all sorts of places we get these stories and the references, but they, they need to be kept fresh in our brains. They need to be fluffed up every once in a while and aired out. And so it is good that the church gives us this three-year cycle where we can go back and we can hear these same stories again. And I hope that every time that I read it, it's almost like, aha, yes, I recall that. We take them out and we dust them off. We prepare them because we never know when we walk out that door whether there's somebody out there who's going to need to know what we are now prepared to teach. And we need them for ourselves. So that when we face a situation, we can say, ah, oh, that reminds me of the Good Samaritan story. Ah, oh, that reminds me of Elijah and Elisha. Ah, oh, that reminds me of the Last Supper. We, we go through our lives not guided just by the secular world, but we go through our life guided an awful lot by our memories and spiritual experiences which have gone along with those memories. And unless you keep them fresh, they end up being sort of dusty on a shelf in the back room. That's not good. This is going to be my last Sunday to preach to you now. For, I won't say forever because who knows? Who knows what's going to happen? I'm going to go off to Europe for six weeks, seven weeks, and when I come back, who knows what's going to happen? You never trust her to say it's the end of anything. I will hopefully be able to come and be with you when you have the installation of your new priest. That would be a wonderful time for me to come back. But since it is my last Sunday, I do want to give this as a thought to you. In this room, there is a tremendous accumulated experience. There's a tremendous accumulated wisdom. And you don't have to wait for the new priest to get here to say, let's pool our wisdom, let's pool our experience, let's pool our enthusiasm and our desire, and we're going to continue being the church even in the meantime. You've got to go ahead and say, we may not have the new visionary leader who's going to take us to the next phase, but we're going to make the best of this phase. Look around at your resources and your tools and your all the blessings you've received. I'm not pointing to anybody in particular. <laughs> Say, how can we take all that we've learned and all that we've experienced and all that we're prepared to do, and how can we do it? We're not waiting. We're not waiting around. Make me proud. Make me proud of everything I've tried to teach you, everything that every priest ever has been here has taught you already. <laughs> be the church that God is asking you to be. And it's not that complicated. Take what you know. Do it. <clears throat> Live it. Sing it. Rejoice it. Never failing to gather together. Encouraging one another, giving out the faith, the peace, the confidence, all of those things that St. Paul has in the Galatians. Live as a church and do not let it become a dusty book on the back shelf. Do not let it become a, a cobwebbed corner of your brain. Waiting around will never benefit, but doing it here and now, with joy in your hearts and a smile on your face and harmony in the air, this will please God immensely. I speak on his behalf. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We'll continue with the Nicene Creed, page 358.
principle form one are found on page 383 in the book of common prayer. With all our heart and with all our mind, let us pray to the Lord, saying, Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above, for the loving kindness of God, and for the salvation of our souls, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the world, for the welfare of the Holy Church of God, and for the unity of all peoples, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For Michael, our presiding bishop, and Andy, Jeff, Hector, and Kay, our bishops, and for all bishops, and for all clergy and people, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For our president, Joe, our Governor Greg, for the leaders of the nations, and for all in authority, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the city of Richmond, for every city and community, and for those who live in them, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For seasonable weather and for an abundance of the fruits of the earth, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the good earth which God has given us, and for the wisdom and will to conserve it, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who travel on land, on water, or in the air, or through outer space, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the aged and infirm, for the widowed and the orphans, and for the sick and the suffering, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. We also pray for Barbara, Benno, Barbara, Alicia, Jerry, Skip, Diana, Deborah, Christopher, Ed, and those for whom the daughters of the king pray. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the poor and the oppressed, for the unemployed and the destitute, for prisoners and captives, and for all who remember and care for them, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all who have died in the hope of the resurrection, and for all the departed, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For deliverance from all danger, violence, oppression, and degradation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. That we may end our lives in faith and hope, without suffering and without reproach. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Defend us, deliver us, and in thy compassion protect us, O Lord, by thy grace. Lord, have mercy. In the communion of St. Mark and of all the saints, let us commend ourselves and one another and all our life to Christ our God. I want to know if there's anyone celebrating birthday or wedding anniversary this week. If not, then would you continue and do you have the prayers for Ukraine and for the parish and for our time of transition? for our parish. <clears throat> Almighty and ever-living God, ruler of all things in heaven and earth, hear our prayers for this parish family. Strengthen the faithful, arouse the careless, and restore the penitent. Grant us all things necessary for our common life, and bring us all to be of one heart and mind within your holy church, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And for transition, God of abounding love, in this interim time, we pray for our parish family of St. Mark's. We pray that our self-reflection be genuine. Teach us to be more loving and forgiving with one another. We pray for patience and wisdom in our discernment. We pray for deep compassion in our relationships, inside and outside the church. We pray for civil discourse and thoughtful communication. Open our hearts to hear your will and deepen our faith as we 
we navigate the months ahead. Calm our fears and anxieties and grant us the peace of your presence. <clears throat> we thank you for the gifts, talents, and skills with which you have blessed us. We thank you for the experiences that have brought us to this moment. Be with us as we move forward, rejoicing with you and supporting one another. All this we pray in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Lord, hear the prayers of your people, and what we have asked faithfully grant that we may obtain effectually to the glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. And turning back in the prayer book to page 360, let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry we have only regret. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Let's welcome our senior warden. Do you have any announcements you need to make? And you're going to step to the microphone today, aren't you? So everyone on the internet can hear as well. First, I, I want to thank Father Ken again um, for being with us today and helping us celebrate. Um, this will be his last week with us, not forever, like he said, but for now. And hopefully um, he can come back sometime in the future and supply for us again. Um, so, so afterwards, like, please join us in the parish hall for a piece of cake and to say goodbye to Father Ken. Um, also, um, if you're visiting with us today, please fill out um, a card in the back of the pew, drop it in the collection plate, so we can just thank you for coming and being with us today. Um, there's a few things going on. It's summer, so not a lot going on, but, you know, check your bulletin for those things and, um, because what I want to say to you today is that I need your help. Um, I know people are anxious to get the search committee going, and I am too. And a lot of you might be sitting tight and waiting and saying, I'd like to be on the search committee. And we will be taking applications for those as soon as we can get the profile committee going. Unfortunately, um, we haven't had a lot of volunteer stuff I can say. I would love to help write that profile. <laughs> um, it doesn't exclude you from being on the search committee. So if you want to be on the search committee, you may also be on the profile committee. So don't feel like, oh, if I do this, then I won't get selected for the search committee. That's not how it works. But according to the, you know, the, the guidelines that the diocese has laid out for us, um, in, or churches in transition in general is um, people on the profile committee it can't be vestry or clergy or um, employees of the church so somebody else has got to step up <laughs> um, so if you would like to and again I, I know I've told you all this before but we had a profile written up you know not that long ago five years ago and so it's actually just a matter of going in. You don't have to, like, rewrite the whole thing. It's just a matter of going in and um, changing some of the numbers because our numbers have changed and maybe changing a few more little things. It's more, more editing than it is, you know, rewriting the whole profile. So um, if you feel like that this is something that you could do, 
and you would be willing to do that, please talk to me after church. And um, and again, you, you can also do, because we just need a couple of people to do this. You can do this at your own pace. Um, you, you know, I, I mean, obviously the sooner the better, but in the sense of there's not like going to be scheduled meetings at certain times. If we can get two or three people to do this, then y'all get together, schedule the times you want to get together and go over this information, yada, yada, yada. Um, the the, the um, vestry is actually responsible for doing a survey with the church. I remember we did Holy Cow last time. We've talked about doing it this time. We've also talked about um, maybe doing a different survey that, that the diocese gives us an option to do um, that's a much cheaper, faster route. So we're, the vestry is talking about maybe doing that instead. Um, but that's not your responsibility. That will be the vestry's responsibility, and hopefully we'll get that done this summer. And then you all can take that information. Uh, whoever wants to be on the profile committee, you can take that information and just tweak the, um, the profile. Um, so, like I said, if that's something you feel called to do or something you feel like you could help with, please let me know. And um, look at your bulletin for the things we have coming up. Melissa, do you have something you want? I apologize for the simpleness of my poster, but um, um, I, I woke up at three this morning and I'm like, oh, I didn't do a sign up for next week. So, uh, next week we are celebrating the fourth with music and um, lunch together. The church is going to provide the hot dogs and all the fixings. Um, I just am asking for people to help set up, um, bring water, tea, and desserts. Um, otherwise, I think we're good to go. Um, and I signed everybody up for cleanup. <laughs> <laughs> because nobody ever signs up that, so everybody signed up for cleanup. But uh, we look forward to having you. Tom's got some great music, uh, patriotic music set up. So. Where would that sign up be? It's going to be in the parish hall after church. Along with the cake. Yes. So twice. Yeah. <laughs> the deal cake. Oh, thank you. Sorry about that. <laughs> the um, Daughters of the King, our uh, purse donation is winding up today. Uh, Chris and I are going to take the purses tomorrow to the women's shelter. Uh, we will shortly be starting a school uh, supply uh, drive. So we'll have a bucket or something set up. That'll probably start in July, mid-July. So is that it? Okay, thank you. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God. <clears throat>
A is found on page 361 of the Black Prayer Book. You'll notice on the altar we have our black communion kit box, and we're going to be blessing the contents of this box as well so that it can take communion to the uh, people who are not able to come to church. So in your prayers, as we focus here, this is also with us in our prayers. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We give thanks to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is right. And a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who on the first day of the week overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection, open to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with St. Mark and all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Now, as our Savior Christ hath taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the highness of the kingdom, 
and the power and the glory forever and ever. sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast. Alleluia. 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 gifts of God for you, the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
final prayer is on page 365. Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace, and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart, through Christ our Lord. This is our lay Eucharistic minister, so I'm going to give the box over into your care. May the blessing of our worship be upon all those who receive it through your loving hands. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. May the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with each and every one of us until we meet again. Amen. Amen.